We've just sifted through about two hours of NVIDIA's annual GTC, or GPU Technology Conference, not to be confused with GDC, where this year the company announced its Hopper H100 GPUs. Hopper is a brand new architecture for NVIDIA. It's an advancement over the Ampere and uh, years ago Volta GPUs previously. And this is preceding what we'll eventually see in the gaming market, which will likely be called Ada or perhaps Lovelace, named after Ada Lovelace. Uh, so we're going to get started with this, talking about the H100 mostly. We'll be going over some of the new server and data center side improvements that NVIDIA has been working on and get you through the uh, major news from the keynote. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal pastes are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut Paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. So what this is, NVIDIA hosts its GPU technology conference every year. It's actually one of the more interesting ones, not even just because of video cards and GPUs, but because at least when we went to them when they were hosted in person, there are often a lot of panels where you could learn graphics technology uh, at a software or a hardware level. So some really cool stuff has come out of there in the past. The main news this time is the Hopper family of GPUs and H100, so we'll walk you through that. The formal announcement of Hopper here focuses on data center and scientific compute. This isn't abnormal for NVIDIA with GTC. Typically, that's where we see it start. Uh, even if this stuff isn't a part of the industry you're in, maybe you just do gaming or just do DIY PC builds, typically it's a good precursor to what's happening, or at least shows you where the major GPU companies are headed for their future designs. So one of the things we typically see is some of the architectural advancements happening in data center and scientific compute moving in some form to the gaming GPUs in the RTX or formerly GTX family. What we know right now is this. NVIDIA's H100 GPU is an 80 billion transistor chip by comparison just for sort of a gaming point of reference. A GA102 RTX 3090 die hosts 28.3 billion transistors. H100 will be fabricated on TSMC's 4N process node. Previous naming would have that being called 4 nanometers. And for bandwidth, either NVIDIA's slide contains an error or CEO Jensen Huang's statement was incorrect because the slide reads 4.9 terabytes with a capital B per second bandwidth while Juan stated 4.9 terabits per second bandwidth. Probably this is a stylization choice by whoever made the slide and they thought that a capital B looked better, but it is actually an eight-fold difference because there are eight bits in a byte. Probably here it's, we're assuming it's 4.9 terabits per second bandwidth just because it seems unlikely that uh, the CEO would get that particular one wrong and no one would catch it, whereas on a slide it, that happens all the time. Anyway, lowercase b, it matters. Can we get like, we need like an awareness campaign on the screen right now. Lowercase b, it matters. Stop capitalizing the b if it's not bytes. Anyway, cool marketing all caps cruise control aside, Hopper will be the first PCIe Gen 5 GPU with the updated protocol likely coming to consumer cards in the RTX 4000 series. And it will also be the first HBM3 GPU. Our audience has likely had the most encounters with HBM via the Vega GPUs previously from AMD. And from NVIDIA, it'd be the Volta GPUs, like the Titan V that we tore down. In the H100's renders, you can see the six HBM modules flanking the central GPU. Some benefits of HBM previously have been things like latency, proximity to the GPU core, so there's less physical distance to travel than memory on a PCB, and better density, of course, and higher bandwidth, hence high bandwidth memory. The downsides are primarily cost, but to some extent, thermal control as all of the heat sources now get compacted into one smaller area. In consumer GPUs, this can become a challenge because you have to cool all of this thermal density in one small area on a board. But in server GPUs like this one, like the H100, it stops mattering because they go in server racks and the fan RPM is cranked up to who cares RPM and the noise levels go up to we're only limited by OSHA decibels. Now, one big difference here is that Hopper is focusing on FP8 or floating point eight. This approach to compute is less precise, but it is far faster and better for dealing with really high quantities of data. So uh, FP16 was sort of a, a focus point previously. FP32 is what you find in consumer cards mostly, or at least the focus in consumer applications and software. Uh, that would be typically called single precision. And then FP64, or historically called double precision, was what you might find in something that's more 
scientifically minded and doesn't need to deal in the sheer quantity of data that you might see for deep learning applications or FPA, FP16 make more sense because the precision starts to matter a lot less and just the processing it all matters more. For example, if you were to process billions of images of dogs so that you could then try and create a synthetic image of a dog out of nothing, FP8, FP16, uh, depending on how the software is built, would theoretically be the typical choice for this, at least to our understanding of deep learning applications and machine learning. Uh, if that's changed in the last year, certainly the commenters will let you know, but that was what we were informed of as of about a year ago. The reason for this is because you just don't need as much precision when you're working on trying to study at a machine level and learn the parameters that will ultimately go into creating the output later once the software is built and the algorithms have learned what they need to do. Now, of course, if you were to process billions of cat images, you would normally want FP64, double precision. And the reason for that is because cats are really fast, so they run through the GPU pipes a lot faster and it's harder to catch them. And that's where FP64 starts to matter. I hope that's cited in a scientific paper somewhere or an academic study and someone thinks that's true, because it is. Speaking of concatenating things, power consumption. Uh, power consumption for this is noteworthy because Hopper is scalable on how it's used. So it can go up to 700 watts. We don't have a nominal power consumption metric from NVIDIA at this time. The only one that we were uh, told or given at this point has been the 700 watt number for a maximum. This may be an indication of a return to high power consumption computing. Uh, even if the efficiency or the performance per watt has gone up, it doesn't change the fact that, that it's still a lot of power. And this is something that we've seen in rumors for the RTX 4000 series as well, where the cards are moving the needle on the maximum power consumption uh, to the extent that we're obviously using different power headers now for some things. And power supplies may need to bump up in sort of the minimum requirement for your PC build for a high-end gaming PC. But back to Hopper. NVIDIA noted that Hopper will have a new Tensor Core design as well and new software for FP8 and for FP16 formats. As for combining things, NVIDIA spent some time explaining that H100 GPUs can be partitioned into seven instances for users of cloud products. So a server farm can dice a single GPU into seven users, or any combination within that, to better optimize the resource availability for the client, and then obviously better split up how they're generating the revenue for the services they sell. The renders of the whole HGX H100 system are actually pretty cool, even if you're not going to be a user of the HGX unit. These take eight H100 modules, or cards basically, and combine them with two CPUs. There's also four Mellanox InfiniBand switches for high-speed in-network computing, and NVIDIA claims this capacity to be at 3.6 teraflops and full PCIe Gen 5 capabilities. Now, Gen 5 PCIe support here likely actually matters for this product, just to relate it back to consumer products, because that's most of our audience. When a new PCIe uh, protocol update comes out when the PCI SIG ratifies something new. It's typically years ahead of what is actually being used or will be used even on the next generation of consumer GPUs. The interface almost always is faster than the product that goes into the interface, which is by design. That's how it's supposed to be. So in other words, consumer products on PCIe Gen 5 versus the maximum capability of PCIe Gen 4, if it's anything like previous generations, you'll see maybe a couple percent difference at the ultra, ultra high end, but otherwise not much. For these types of products though, where you're linking uh, multiple H100s all together or multiple whatever server or data center type cards that uh, are extremely performance focused, run faster than consumer cards, it starts to matter more. And that's also where you see other technologies come into play like NVLink. So the DGX H100 will run two CPUs with Gen 5 support. NVIDIA did not name the CPUs at the time of announcement. A DGX H100 will run eight H100 GPUs and 640 gigabytes of HBM3 for memory for those GPUs with support for 32 DGXs connected simultaneously via NVIDIA's updated NVLink switch system. That would result in a 256 GPU computer using H100s and 20.5 terabytes of HBM3 for the memory. And that all would act as more or less a single GPU uh, as NVIDIA has, has built it in its presentation. So NVIDIA is also working on its own mini supercomputer. It typically does this as a sort of a showcase. Our imagination of how this works is probably someone from Amazon shows up, walks through the warehouse and goes, yes, yes, I would like one of those. Oh, they're on sale for only $250 million this week. We'll take seven. 
That's probably how it goes. So they're working on another one. This one is called EOS. It's running 576 DGXs. We need like a Jeff Bezos laugh in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now the joke feels complete. Sorry, I had to go back for that one. It made a lot of sense in that context. Uh, this would be a 4,608 H100 GPU solution in EOS, which is its mini supercomputer. It's building uh, within NVIDIA. And total power consumption, we don't know. It will be high. But NVIDIA would undoubtedly mostly speak to the performance per watt or the efficiency in processing versus previous generations because that has uh, pretty much always gone up generationally. NVIDIA claims that EOS will be more powerful than the Fugaku supercomputer in Japan, which is the world's largest supercomputer. But when it made that claim, it specifically pointed out that EOS would be more powerful in AI supercomputing. We don't cover supercomputers enough to know if Fugaku would still outperform EOS in some other task, maybe something more suitable to its design, but uh, that's the point NVIDIA was making at least, and it was focusing on AI. Throughout the conference, it became clear that one of NVIDIA's goals is to merge as many technologies as possible to reduce bottlenecks. The next was combining the CX-7 NIC with H100 GPUs and PCIe Gen 5 and calling it the H100 CNX. This is a different product than the other H100s. This is designed to circumvent the CPU, the PCIe interface, and system memory, thus allowing most or all of the processing to remain on one add-in card. Removing interfaces and other components always improves speed of device, if only for the physical distance reduction, though speed limitations of the various protocols and interfaces are also a factor. And finally, on the hardware side here, despite the NVIDIA ARM acquisition or merger getting killed at this point, NVIDIA is still forging ahead with its Gray CPU. This was announced previously. This CPU isn't news, but uh, some aspects of its use are. So this one was a collaboration with ARM, and the CPU is pictured on the same board in this most recent GTC keynote uh, as an H100 GPU. So NVIDIA is calling this combined solution the Grace Hopper Superchip. The board is densely packed with both HBM and memory modules, and the VRM is massive, as you would expect. NVIDIA says that Grace will be a 144 core CPU in this solution with one terabyte per second memory bandwidth using LPDDR5X. Other claims around this part of the presentation include a, quote, only 500 watt power consumption in total with Grace Hopper combined and one terabyte of memory. It's actually not too bad on the power consumption for that one. This uses NVIDIA's chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, bypassing existing interfaces on a more traditional motherboard. So this recap puts you at the bulk of the information in that presentation. If you're wondering what was in the other hour plus of the presentation, it's primarily AI and deep learning. Some of it is actually really cool, just purely from a technology perspective. It's not stuff we cover, but showing things like um, how Amazon works with robotics, for example, is a little interesting. Not worth watching the whole video for, but kind of amusing at least. So you may want to look into that if you're just kind of, uh, you find robotics or AI or deep learning fun to, to learn about, but otherwise you're not missing much if you just skip the rest of the keynote. There are a couple funny references in there, like talking about making a, quote, cool leather jacket uh, look like synthetic leather and not just plastic when talking about the AI Jensen, but otherwise it's largely targeted at big enterprise companies and not consumers for this one, which isn't a complaint really, that's just how it is. So uh, there are a lot of potential pros to AI and deep learning in general. NVIDIA goes through some of those, like some of the medical advancements and technologies, certainly in logistics and shipping, there are a lot of benefits to be had there, potentially reducing um, some of the, the footprint required to do those things. Uh, but then there's also sort of the, the hint of dystopia that you always get watching these, where maybe it's just because there's so much dystopian media, like movies and things, that were created before we ever got to this era of technology. So we've all been preconditioned to be a little bit weary of it. You just see some of the technologies and they give that weird vibe. So for example, one of them was the, and this has been done before, but it's getting advanced, was moving a speaker's eyes up from a script to appear like they're looking at the camera, even though in reality they're not. There's a pretty big difference in how the speaker looks. Certainly I could spot the difference being camera trained and used to looking between a script and a camera. It, it's kind of obvious to me when it's faked, but it would trick a lot of people, especially if you're on a more limited bit rate or if you're stuck on like 720p or something for a video conferencing stream. So that's kind of weird. It takes a lot of the human and the personality out of it. And it seems like a very, C-suite executive thing to worry about. Where, 
Where are my eyes pointing? Does it look like I have to read? Is that going to be perceived as a weakness? And then we'll lose share value because shareholders think that I can't remember more than one sentence at a time. What do we do? Let's, let's trick it so that my eyes look like they're looking at the camera instead of using more traditional means, like being a human and being OK with looking that way. Uh, there were also some other weird factors in there. So for example, uh, the live translation of human speech from one language into another. It was interesting. We'll drop in a quick clip of it here. While I don't speak Spanish, with Maxine's help, now I can. Ahora puedo hablar tu idioma con mi propia voz. Impresionante, no? Magnifico. Pas mal, mais est-ce que Maxine comprend aussi d'autres langues? Oh yes, absolutely. Maxine me permet aussi de parler français et bien d'autres langues. Interesting, but as someone who is actively learning another language and has learned other languages, uh, I, I highly suspect that the live translation will not be that great. <laughs> Typically, you can't use things like complex sentences and traditional speech to get an accurate translation. So curious how that'll work out, especially because accidentally saying something offensive or confusing, like my hovercraft is full of eels, is going to be a, a lot weirder for the listener than if you just sort of typed it and then that came out of a translation software like Google Translate. Anyway, looking forward to the future of hovercrafts being full of eels. Uh, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to support us in our reporting and coverage of events like this one. We'll see you all next time.